Thank you, Rich. Uh, you're much too kind. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, an honor to be here. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, KPM treatment. And I, I put down 25 years um, because 1994 was actually the, the year that my, my mom died of, of uh, metastatic cancer. And uh, I just heard Dr. Rochin this morning say 25 years isn't long enough. So it, uh, it, it probably is. And we still don't have a, a definitive cure yet. Uh, these are my disclosures. And I just wanted to start by saying how honored I am to be giving this lectureship in, in, uh, in Dr. Goodwin's name. Uh, as as uh, Rich said, he, uh, he's um, uh, seen my uh, amazing neurosurgeon. I unfortunately have never met him, but getting Mrs. Goodwin uh, last night and, and the family, um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, this is really an honor. Um, so, uh, in terms of current treatments uh, for glioblastoma, um, the, uh, the, the standard of care actually really hadn't, hadn't changed a whole lot since the 1970s. Um, you know, radiation uh, was the standard of care uh, started in the 70s, and, and really you know, not a whole lot you know, changed over the, the subsequent 20 uh, years or so. Um, and then uh, when uh, when I you know started uh, in, uh, uh, as, as a chief resident and then as a faculty member, this was you know in the mid '90s. That's kind of when we started to get some movement in terms of FDA approvals for new treatments besides BCNU for uh, for GBMs. Uh, there was uh, BCNU wafers. Um, uh, the glial wafers and then temozolomide uh, was approved in the late 90s, but it wasn't really until 2005 when the STU protocol became uh, popular that uh, really now the standard of care is surgical resection, radiation, and temozolomide, and, and that's it. Uh, there have been subsequently a, a few other FDA approved uh, treatments, one is the Cizumab or current GBM. And then the uh, the option of the tumor treating field uh, just recently uh, gained FDA approval as a device uh, now the treatment. But uh, but you know that that was kind of the the uh, landscape. Uh, and so if you kind of go back to early '90s, you could see really all we were doing at the time was radiation, and the median survival for patients at that time uh, was. Probably somewhere between nine months to you know, and then the addition of chemosolomide or getting it to about a year and a half to two years. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, my my mom died of uh, you know metastatic cancer, uh, it was breast cancer, but the problem was that uh, it was the actually the brain mix that uh, that couldn't be controlled. It was basically something uh, unique about the brain and, and cancers in the brain. Uh, so that's when I decided to uh, go into uh, do oncology. I actually you know went back to school uh, and. Uh, Shifted my career. Actually, initially thought I was going to go into you know trauma surgery or or, uh, or vascular neurosurgery, um, but then I decided I was going to learn more about cancer. So um, so I remember in graduate school I, I attended a lecture by this gentleman uh, Ralph Steinman, and he talked about a cell that he had discovered. Actually, he discovered the cell in the seventies. Uh, this is a cell called this immune cell called dendritic cell, uh, dendritic cell. But it wasn't until the late 90s when people actually discovered how to uh, extract these cells and make them in large quantities outside of the body. So that's when the cell actually uh, was thought to be uh, a viable therapeutic. And what a dendritic cell is, and then uh, Dr. Steinman actually subsequently won a Nobel Prize for this discovery um, two decades later. But what it is is it's an uh, innate immune cell. It comes from the bone marrow, and it actually uh, migrates to peripheral organs to capture antigen. And then uh, the, the uh, activated uh, antigen-presenting cells are then uh, uh, home to T cells to activate T cells. And you know, hearing him talk about this, this cell, uh, it seemed like the Ginsu knife of uh, immune therapy. It did everything. It had all the right. Uh, cofactors, it had antigen uh, uptake capabilities, it had, it had migration capabilities, it could hunt down T cells, activate T cells, and it really was just, you know, it seemed like a, a, a great um, adjuvant for uh, an immune response uh, to, to cancer cells. And, and one thing that, as you all know, is frustrating about glioblastoma surgery is that you can do a great surgery 
and you don't see any tumor ultimately <coughs> on the MRI scan or surgically, but the tumor comes back within months. So there must be some way to try to get to these cells that you can't see, and, uh, and uh, clearly radiation and chemotherapy wasn't, uh, wasn't enough. So, uh, so we, you know, went back to the lab, and, and uh, you know, what, what we found was that these cells, you know, like I said, uh, are very good at, at picking up antigen. Uh, basically, uh, uh, macro, uh, they, they were essentially good macrophages that could uh, activate uh, T cells. And the, the at the time, their D cells were not felt to reside in the brain. There wasn't this mechanism of ad antigen presentation and T cell activation in the brain. So the thought was really to take these cells out of the body, uh, and then since we're doing the brain tumor surgeries anyway, take the tumor and then actually co-culture them in, in cell culture. This is what happens when you co-culture them. The, the antigen-presenting cell picks up the tumor. And then uh, these cells can activate T cells, and we did show that these activated T cells can kill tumor cells in vitro. And that led to uh, some in vivo studies, and, uh, and we, were one of the, we were the first group to actually show that by doing this, we were able to get activated T cells into the brain. Um, and uh, this is uh, pretty uh, well known now, but at the time, there was still a very strong concept of immune privilege in the brain and the, the idea that uh, you really can't get an immune response mounted against uh, brain tumors. So, uh, so we did show that the, um, I don't know if there's a pointer, but there was a increased survival uh, with the animals uh, that were treated with this. And then uh, I you know, used that preliminary data to apply for a K award while I was on maternity leave. Uh, so that's actually, I always remember this because it was the, uh, the year my, my son was born. Um, and then uh, subsequently, uh, we uh, went on to do a uh, first in human uh, clinical trial of this uh, in, in a glioblastic location. And uh, I got a uh, R21 grant to do this trial um, on the, you know, when I was on maternity leave when my daughter was born. Uh, and during the three years between, uh, between this, uh, I must say I had a lot of uh, dedicated research time um, because, to be honest, uh, LA is a competitive environment and no one was actually looking for a pregnant neurosurgeon uh, to do their, uh, to do their brain tumor surgery. So it wasn't a, uh, you know, really uh, out of choice, but it was just the fact that I couldn't really build a very busy practice, so I had a lot of time in the lab. Uh, but in a way, that, that, that was good. I mean, the, the dedicated time allowed me to, to really, uh, you know, focus my efforts uh, in, in uh, you know, in, in my research. And, uh, and then subsequently, you know, I was able to get three R1s um, uh, related to this particular uh, to this area. So we went from a first in human trial of this uh, vaccine concept uh, to a phase one, uh, subsequently phase two, and then uh, and then eventually uh, you know uh, phase three clinical trials. So uh, so I wanted to tell you about um, uh, you know a, a patient uh, that one of the first patients we enrolled in this trial which was actually patient number three, um, and. Uh, he, he was a 33-year-old uh, man uh, with a new onset seizure, speech aphasia. This was a scan, very typical looking, little blastoma light scan. He did an awake surgery because this was in his dominant uh, uh, language uh, areas. And, uh, you know, like uh, every good neurosurgeon, we try to get a uh, maximally uh, gross total resection. So, so, uh, so, we, uh, so I was able to uh, respect the tumor. Um, and then, uh, you know, the pathology, you know, unfortunately, came back glioblastoma, and uh, it, it, it very kind of textbook classic glioblastoma case. Uh, at KI67 index, 25 to 30%, so it's positive for EGFR, uh, and it was uh, MGMT methylated, although at the time we were just beginning to understand what MGMT methylation meant in this context. Um, so, uh, he went on to get radiation and chemozolomide. This was the STUD protocol when it was just kind of being rolled out at the time. And then uh, we enrolled him in our phase one clinical trial of uh, autologous tumor lysate pulse dendritic cells. Um, and, uh, and it was one of these things where, you know, 
not sure if it would have worked or not, um, but it was the, the safety trial, basically, just to see that if it was safe. And, and uh, I remember at the time there, uh, you know, <coughs> the grant review comments came back as, uh, well, how do you know you're not going to induce, uh, you know, EAE in these patients? You know, a huge immune response, and, and you know, at the time we, we, we didn't know that. Uh, but um, but this patient, um, you know, he at the time I did his surgery, his wife was seven months pregnant, um, and so uh, you know, he uh, when when he had his son, uh, he got into this local newspaper, and you know, he had successful surgery, and you know, all was well, and. Um, and then when his son was a year old, um, I got a Christmas card, and that's the son there, his friend Junior. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's always so nice to get, you know, Christmas cards from, from patients. And unfortunately, um, in, uh, in, in the, you know, when, when you have a practice of glioblastoma, you, know, you often don't get more than, you know, one or two Christmas cards from, from you know, from patients. Uh, because like you said median survival at the time was only, you know, one or two years. Um, he did like you know the you know the vaccine. He did that for a year and then uh, kind of just went on and, and got you know serial MRI scans. Five years later, I got another Christmas card, um, and his son was five years old. Ten years later, uh, another one. Uh, this is the son. Uh, you know, when his son was ten, and. Uh, and so when he reached the five-year point, we started to, you know, we were getting a few of these patients. You know, we started to look at, you know, well, what, what is common about these patients that are living longer? You know, what is it that, that is different about their tumor um, or their immune system? And uh, in this case, uh, what we found was that he actually uh, had a high uh, expression of CMV. Uh, and, uh, and uh, what we also found was that if he took his blood after vaccination, so that's the panel here before therapy, and after therapy, uh, four, you know, more than four percent of his T cells were activated against CMV. So, so essentially, we were actually giving him a vaccine that activated against this viral antigen that uh, you know, potentially was what was uh, kind of uh, present in his tumor and able to attack and kill his tumor. Um, however, we did not find CMV in, in all the long-term survivors. So it wasn't just CMV, it's probably something else, and we still to this day don't know what that something else is. Um, but my you know, personal feeling is when, uh, when you see these long-term survivors from uh, you know, oncolytic or viral therapy, a lot of that is probably due to an immune response to the virus as opposed to the actual kind of oncolytic uh, destruction of the tumor cells themselves. Um, so, so I think there you know, is um, this, this you know, tale of long-term survivorship uh, in patients where uh, you actually can uh, mount an immune response to these tumors. So, uh, so we, we you know, looked even further at the group of patients that, uh, that were uh, initial, in the initial trials. And uh, you know, one criticism was like, well, maybe you're just picking the, the good, good patients, you know, the, what we call the pro-neural uh, GBMs, the ones that tend to do well anyway. Um, so uh, we did you know, the kind of microarray analysis on, on, uh, on the first uh, group of trial patients. And what it turned out was that um, actually, the pro-neural subgroup, which is the group on the top, that group actually did not live any longer than would be expected, given their good, favorable GPM subtype. Um, but it was the mesenchymal subgroup, the, the group that actually tended to do worse, um, that, uh, that lived longer. And in that group, we actually had a 50% uh, long-term survival rate. And this was published, you know, uh, five, uh, five years or so after uh, the trial was started, that tail end of patients, um, they're still alive today. So, uh, so there's something about that specific subset of, of patients uh, that, that tends to uh, suggest that they, they could have long-term survival in, in this, uh, you know, with, with immune therapy, not, not just this immune therapy, but perhaps uh, others that are uh, being developed. Um, what we found was that this mesenchymal um, subgroup of glioblastoma actually uh, tended to be the ones that had what we, you know this, this kind of imaging response where the uh, the tumor actually looks worse. You get a little bit of increased contrast enhancement, and then it subsequently goes away. So so there, this is uh, 
you know, the, the whole idea of pseudo progression, and we're seeing that more and more now with the, the new treatments that, that you know, we're, we're using for glioblastoma, that sometimes the tumors look worse before they get better. And this subgroup also uh, tended to be the ones where the T cells get into the tumor uh, after, uh, after immunotherapy. So, so there's something unique about this particular subgroup of patients uh, that, uh, you know, that tended to uh, favor a better uh, response to immunotherapy. But one thing uh, to note is that the uh, increased uh, T cell infiltration, and, and we've done many studies uh, you know, related to this over the years, it, it is a necessary factor in, in all these long-term survivors, but it's not sufficient. So the fact that you get T cells into these tumors doesn't necessarily mean you are going you know, to be a long-term survivor. So there's something else going on in sub another subgroup of these patients. Um, so getting back to Brad, um, you know, I just saw him, uh, this past month, and uh, it's been 16 years now, and he's still doing fun. <laughs> and and his tumor, uh, and this is a scan from a few months back. Um, his tumor's not only he's not only survived 16 years; he's survived without a recurrence. Um, so so and, and so so I think that's actually quite uh, important uh, because. It's one thing to survive glioblastoma, and, but then undergo you know four or five, six you know, surgeries and, and chemo and treatments. But a lot of these patients, if we treat them early on, um, they they, they uh, are, are living long term. I say a lot, you know, it's, it's still a minority of the, you know the, the uh, in, in all these trials that we've done. Um, these kind of long tail end of the curve, they, they constitute about 20 to 25 percent of the patients. Uh, over the years now, about three dozen of these kind of long-term survivors. Um, if you, when they, you know, started, in, you know, uh, in in, uh, in neuro oncology 25 years ago, um, it was very rare to, to see a long-term survivor beyond, you know, three years. You know, now now there 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 are more, and and you know, and, you know, I have. Uh, people now over 15 years, not not the majority, uh, but but I think it, it is it, it is uh, possible. So getting back to so what do, what is unique about these tumors again? So for for Brad and actually for a lot of these long term survivors, like I said, they they tended to be of the mesenchymal subtype. Um, they uh, they were MGMT methylated, and uh, interestingly, IDH1 wild type. So IDH1 is a mutation in, in glioblastoma, and you know, having a mutation uh, tends to suggest a better uh, prognosis, and it's probably a different type of glioblastoma, an IDH1 mutated versus a non-mutated glioblastoma. And you know, last year the, the WHO rewrote the textbooks to, to really classify glioblastomas based on, on IDH1 status. Uh, the IDH1 mutation wasn't discovered until 2009, so at the time we started these trials, we didn't know to look for it. It wasn't discovered yet. So, but going back and looking at these patients, the, the majority of the long-term survivors were right, actually the um, poor prognostic uh, patients, the ones that were IDH1 wild type. Um, so this is kind of the timeline for clinical development of, of this trial. Like I said, we, we kind of started the first uh, phase one safety trials in the late 90s and uh, got the uh, phase one IND. Uh, in uh, the late, late 90s, did phase one, phase one, two, and then uh, subsequently uh, the uh, company took this to uh, phase three uh, clinical trial. Uh, of note, the, the multi center clinical trial started in 2007, uh, and then uh, the, the problem with that was that the trial was initially non blinded. And, and this is actually a problem with a lot of. Uh, uh, neuro-oncology trials. Um, if you can imagine, if you're a patient with a glioblastoma, most patients don't want to be the placebo arm of a, of a trial. Um, so uh, so when, when it was a non-blinded trial, and part of that was cost, um, because in order to make this vaccine, you need to do a leukophoresis, and you, you need to process the tumor tissue. So, uh, so the control patients did not get the leukophoresis. So, so at the, the fact that they didn't get the leukophoresis they, they knew that they weren't um, the, the treatment arm, they were the control arm. So a lot of people dropped out, you know, on the, on the mood, and then, you know, you can't blame them. Why would you want to stay on the trial to be the control arm? Uh, so uh, so we, 
actually didn't kind of uh, accrue a lot of controlled patients uh, for that trial. And then the, uh, the recession hit in 2008, and, uh, and basically there was, you know, uh, limited funding for uh, uh, for this company to, to go on and continue the trial. So, so things kind of stayed stagnant for a while, and then um, in uh, in 2010 or so. Uh, Immunotherapy for brain tumors became popular. You know, it was an unpopular thing in the 90s, but but then you know, normal people were getting uh, uh, you know uh, results in the early phase trials, and there were more trials being uh, conducted and more research in this field. Uh, so then, uh, you know, people uh, began began looking for immunotherapy trials. And, uh, and uh, subsequently, this is actually when we also, you know, my, my clinical practice really picked up because a lot of people were looking for, for these trials. Um, uh, but this time around, we made it blinded. Uh, everybody got leukophoresis, everybody got vaccine made, and then it was a truly randomized trial. Uh, that trial finished accruing in 2015, and, uh, you know, we, we just uh, recently at the SNOW meeting uh, had the three-year uh, follow-up results from those patients. So, uh, so the, the design of this trial was actually, you know, just a classic randomized trial, and I thought at the time it was, it was a good uh, uh, design, but, uh, but there were certainly problems with this clinical trial design, and I'll mention what, what I've learned over the years. Uh, so one thing I learned is that no one wants to be the placebo on these trials, so you can't really design a, a truly randomized trial with a uh, control arm. Um, and, or a, uh, a non-blinded control arm. But, uh, so basically patients had surgery, they had radiation and zolomide, and then uh, they were ran after the post-radiation and zolomide MRI scan, they were randomized through the vaccine or placebo. And then the end point was progression-free survival and overall survival. Um, at the time, again, um, because it was uh, harder to uh, enroll patients when there wasn't really a, uh, a clinical benefit for patients enrolled in the placebo arm, even though uh, they were blinded, most people wanted to go to phase one trials or phase two trials where they were guaranteed of getting a, a, an actual treatment. Uh, because of that, we actually added a crossover arm at progression. Um, and. Uh, at the time, it seemed like this was uh, you know, was fine, but it actually subsequently muddied uh, the, the, the the kind of the, the data analysis afterwards. And why that that happened was because of this concept of pseudo progression that, that I mentioned earlier. So uh, so and and what happened over this time period is also the uh, the uh, the way we interpret imaging kind <laughs> changed. Uh, so the initial trial was kind of written based on the McDonald criteria of, of kind of just looking uh, at the MRI scans and looking at growth uh, on the MRI scans. And this was done by blinded radiologists. So they had no uh, information about the clinical uh, um, uh, condition of the, the patient. So they didn't know which arm the patients were in, but also did not know the, the clinical uh, history. The thing is, uh, Subsequent to that, in 2010, we went to you know Reno and iRaino, which is immune uh, uh, radiographic uh, assessments of, of, uh, of response. And, and the reason these subsequent imaging uh, kind of interpretations were, were adopted was because they did take into account uh, clinical factors, things like decadron dosing. You know, if the patients were on decadron, if the patients were clinically deteriorating or not, because it turns out that a lot of times when you get pseudo-progression, the, the images look bad, but the patient doesn't. So, so there is uh, some leeway in terms of that interpretation, but, uh, but at the time the trial was written, uh, that wasn't the standard. The standard was you send the, the scans out to a radiologist, and, and you know the radiologist is blinded, and, and uh, that's what we got assigned to either progression or non-progression. Um, and then, so, so this is kind of uh, looking back at the, uh, the older phase two data uh, from our initial trials. This is kind of what happens after uh, immunotherapy for, uh, for glioblastomas oftentimes. You often get this um, 
increase in, in, in new uh, or, or enhancement. And you can see it actually looks quite ugly sometimes. Uh, and then uh, over time, it kind of goes away. And that pseudo progression window uh, could be up to you know 60 days, so so at least two months um, after uh, after the treatment. Um, and um, the you know the the thing is, I think a lot, a lot of these patients perhaps were taken off trial a little too early, or went on the crossover arm. Actually, most people didn't want to come off trial; they went on the crossover arm. So, so actually, they, they got the vaccine. Um, but it does muddy your randomization um, at the time. And then another problem um, with immunotherapy trials is that. Uh, you know, in the past, we wrote them like uh, chemotherapy trials, you know, so we're looking at uh, differences in median survival, you know, basically, if you say, and this is just a, an example of another trial, um, if you take two, two groups and then you look at the 50th, you know, survival at the 50th percentile, and you look for your p-value and your statistical significance at the p uh, 50th percentile, the, the problem there is, um, like I said, this treatment probably doesn't work in 75% of the patients. You know, the long-term survivor tail is, is only about 20 to 25%. So what we may be missing is this kind of uh, uh, potential efficacy in this the subgroup of patients when we look at differences in median survival uh, between the two groups. Um, and so I think in the, the, the field of uh, immuno-oncology, we really also need to think about not just how we assess progression, but also how we um, assess survival endpoints. You know, and it may be that we would should look at a hazard ratio at three years or five years, as opposed to the median, you know, differences in median survival. Um, so because of all this, even though the, this uh, trial's been finished for a few years now, um, the uh, it still hasn't been unblinded, um, and the I guess the uh, the trigger to unblind was uh, seventy five percent of events. Events uh, in this case because um, progression free survival was kind of muddy, like I said, because of the pseudo progression. The events that uh, are, are pretty concrete um, were, were were death. You know, you can't. You're either dead or you're not. You can't really, uh, you know, have any misinterpretation about that. So overall survival um, after three years, um, in this, uh, in, and this is the intent to treat population. This is basically all the patients in both groups. It's not blinded. But keep in mind, um, because of the crossover arm, it actually turns out that the majority of patients actually did get the vaccine at some point. Um, so, the, so this actually probably turn, is going to turn out to be a very large single arm study that just uh, has a variable where some patients got the vaccine early and some patients got the vaccine late. Um, but as of uh, late 2018, the three-year survival was still 28.2%. So, uh, so for glioblastoma, I must say, if I you know, turn back the clock 25 years ago, three-year survival for this, this disease was about 3 to 5%. Um, at best. Um, so, so I think we are making progress in the field. There are these kind of novel treatments that are coming out. And it's not just this trial. I think, you know, the, there are a lot of other trials um, using, you know, poliovirus and, and other things where we are seeing small pockets of efficacy in, in small populations of, of patients. Um, and breaking this down a little bit more, um, like I said, in our early trials, it seemed like IDH1 wild type and MGMT methylation correlated with a better response. Breaking this down even more, if we look at just the MGMT methylation, you know, so patients were MGMT methylated, um, we're getting a three-year survival rate in that subgroup of 49%. So, uh, so that's a like almost 50% three-year survival in glioblastoma cohort uh, with a pretty standard biomarker that we now all measure. So, uh, so you know, in thinking about how to design future trials, I, I think this is really kind of what we need to figure out. You know, what subgroup of patients to do these trials in, and uh, and how do we, uh, you know, really target our therapies to that particular subgroup so we do get uh, large differences in survival like this. 
um, because the unmethylated group, you know, even though, you know, two years of viral at 32% isn't bad, I mean, it's still, you know, quite good for glioblastoma, it's significantly less than the NTMT methylated group. Um, so, so going back to the lab, you know, what's the biology behind this? Why would MGMT methylation uh, suggest a better response to immunotherapy? And as you know, um, MGMT is actually now a very common marker that, that we look at in glioblastomas because um, it suggests a better response to chemotherapy. Um, it may not just be a response to chemotherapy, it, it just is a better prognostic marker overall. So, um, so part of that could be uh, an innate immune response that's induced by, by therapies. And one thing that we do um, know about these MGMT methylated tumors is that they do tend to have a higher rate of mutations. Uh, and, and actually the mesenchymal subgroup of tumors have a higher rate of mutations. And that's actually probably why they do worse, because they're more mutated, more, uh, you know, they're, they're uglier tumors. And, and, uh, and for those of you that, that do you know, you know, these tumors in the operating room, they're the ugly looking ones. They're the ones that are kind of bloody and messy and, and uh, just uh, look, look like your classic uh, uh, glioblastomas. But because they have a high number of mutations, that's probably why your immune system is able to recognize it better. Um, because you know, the whole concept of, of uh, an immune response is really to differentiate uh, foreign from self. And, um, and you know, this has actually been found in other cancers as well, such as colon cancer and, and uh, other uh, cancers in the field. Um, so in terms of future directions, you know, so where, where, where uh, does, does all this kind of take us next? Because yes, we are getting some, you know, uh, small pockets of long-term survivors in all these, uh, all these trials, but uh, we still have, you know, 75% of people who don't live past three years and, you know, they don't get to go to their, their kids' uh, high school graduations and things like that. Um, and and so, so one thing we're looking at is the, the why, you know, why does immunotherapy fail? So as I mentioned, uh, it looked like when we looked at our, our uh, tumor samples, T cell infiltration after vaccination, that did correlate with a better uh, uh, survival rate, but that in itself wasn't sufficient. So, so there's a group of patients where you get increased T cells and they seem to do better, you know, uh, clinically. There's another group where you actually get increased T cells, but in addition to getting the increased T cells, you also get increased uh, inhibitory tumor infiltrating macrophages and other immunosuppressive cells. So it's almost as if the, uh, the vaccination, because you're inducing an immune response, the body's actually uh, inducing an immunosuppressive response to counteract that. And that's probably um, a good thing because or else you know you get multiple sclerosis and other diseases like that if your body didn't really protect, or if the brain didn't protect itself from uh, an immune attack. Um, so that's actually where these uh, new, uh, you know, kind of checkpoint inhibitors, immune inhibitors come in. And uh, the ones that have been FDA approved for other cancers, like the PD-1 inhibitors, uh, block PD-1. And what we have found is that, uh, for instance, some of the times when we get these T cells that come into the tumors, the T cells have upregulation of PD. P1 or P and, and uh, tumor environment, microenvironment has a regulation of PDL1. So one way to counteract that would be to combine the vaccination with the PD1 inhibitor. Um, the tumor infiltrating macrophages, uh, there's now an inhibitor to that, that as well. The uh, plexicon uh, makes a drug to CSF R1. And that hopefully, because there's also a population where we get these infiltrating macrophages. So, so those are different combinations of of uh, kind of immune uh, modulation that, that uh, we're looking into into the future. So uh, getting back to the timeline, this takes a very long time <laughs> to go from animal studies, in vitro studies, um, back to, you know, in the late 90s, that's when we started, and then going on to phase one, phase two, and then phase three, and then eventually, you know, now we're starting these kind of uh, combination trials. Um, a lot of that is actually uh, designed from what we learned in all the subsequent, or all the previous trials uh, before it. Um, but during that whole time period, uh, 
the cancer immunotherapy field has really exploded in other cancers. Um, just in the last four years, there have been 20 um, FDA-approved immunotherapy drugs for cancers for all these indications, but none, none yet for brain cancer. We actually did not have an FDA-approved immunotherapeutic for brain cancer. Part of it was because of these kind of complications with clinical trial design that, that I've mentioned. Um, and, but part of it is also because of, I think, the immune, uh, there is a, a unique immune privilege of, of the brain, and it may not just be enough to activate an immune response, but we need to actually also block the immunosuppression. Um, and it, it's not for lack of trying. As I said, you know, since since the um, since about 2010 or so, I say over the last 10 years, um, there have been several trials, large uh, fa phase three, uh, phase two, phase three trials of the gene therapies for glioblastoma. Uh, there was the EGFR vaccine trial, the heat shock protein uh, vaccine trial. Uh, and uh, Checkmate 143 was the uh, uh, randomized trial for the PD-1 inhibitors and, uh, that was uh, approved for uh, melanoma and, and uh, other cancers. Um, and in 2007, actually all these trials uh, were reported as, as being failed trials. They, none of them uh, reached their endpoints, um, partly because of, I, I think, some uh, uh, issues with endpoint uh, design, uh, but also partly with timing of how these treatments were given and, and really um, kind of thinking of the biology of the disease. I think, for instance, I think um, the uh, EGFR vaccine uh, trial, you know, one, one thought now is that it's, you know, it's very difficult to target a single antigen because of the heterogeneity of the tumor. And I could go on, you know, in terms of the various other uh, reasons why this, these trials were, were deemed as, uh, as unsuccessful. But, um, but I, I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, and I think what um, there's a lot to be learned from failed trials. And I think that's one thing that, uh, that you know, people don't really uh, do very much, especially companies. You know, if companies don't get us a consult trial, you know, that goes to the shelf and, you know, they don't develop it any further. But I think in academics, we, we do have that luxury that we're not really just trying to make a you know, blockbuster drug, we really need to you know, understand the disease and, and how, to, how to come at this. So one uh, concept, like as I mentioned, is, could potentially be the timing of, of when these drugs are given. So, uh, so as I mentioned, checkpoint 143 was the big uh, checkpoint inhibitor trial that failed for glioblastoma. Um, and the way that trial was done was that you know people were given uh, the uh, inhibitor um, at the time of progression, but there was no surgery done. It was basically people were randomized either to the drug or no drug. Um, and there were different ways to do this. There was also post, you know, surgery was done, and then patients were randomized to the drug. And that didn't work either. Um, so, uh, so in collaboration with uh, Patrick Wynn at, uh, at, at Harvard, and you know, um, you know, our group uh, and, uh, and the Harvard group did this trial uh, looking at uh, neoadjuvant uh, PD-1 inhibition, and, and this was just published last month. Um, and what, what it was was basically giving the checkpoint inhibitors before surgery, doing the surgery, and then just continuing, uh, you know, adjuvantly. And the, the two, there's, you know, two, two groups. One was, you had the inhibitor before surgery, one didn't. Both groups got surgery, and both groups got the adjuvant PD-1. And as you can see, there was actually a statistically significant difference in their survival, uh, albeit, you know, small in numbers. This was, um, you know, about a 30 patient, 35 patient uh, trial. Um, there, there was a difference, and what we found actually, the, 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 uh, during surgery, we actually took the tumor tissue and, and we did, uh, did a genomic analysis, and we did find differences in, uh, in uh, genetic um, uh, you know, markers related to the neoadjuvant fit versus the adjuvant group. And that's one area where I think, you know, uh, neurosurgeons. Um, Useful, uh, is actually the, the, the study of the tumor tissue. Um, and, and I think um, one thing that's been uh, important in, in terms of you know, our research at UCLA over the years is that um, 
uh, I started collecting my, my tumor samples in 1994. So we have a very large tumor bank at this point, and, and we have a lot of uh, tumor tissue to study. But, but this trial, um, we really wouldn't learn as much from it if we didn't have the tumor tissue after the treatment. So I think what happens is that you need to activate the immune response. So, so the fact that, so the reason that this doesn't work after you take the tumor out is because you actually need the tumor in the body to serve as a source of antigen. So you actually need a immune activation so that you, you have the antigen and then you could activate the T cells or, or unblock the immune suppression to act, get the activated immune response. But you actually need to take the tumor out because the tumor grows faster than your T cells can. So it's really a competition when you know if the tumors are growing at a you know a proliferation index of 30%, your T cells can't keep up and, and, and really kill that big bulk of the tumor. So that's where when you do surgery, you actually reduce that to this minimum minimal disease state. And then you already have your activated T cells, you can hopefully keep that going with uh, adjuvant uh, PD-1 inhibitors. So, um, so that's actually, you know, because of all the failed trials we've had over the years in glioblastoma, that's actually been the focus of our SPORE grant. Um, and, and uh, you know, we, we have a, a UCLA, we have a brain cancer SPORE, it's a P50 uh, program project grant. And the, the whole theme of it is actually uh, tumor resistance. So, so what we're actually asking is why do our treatments fail? And project one is why immunotherapy fails, and that's actually uh, you know, what, what I just uh, discussed. Uh, project two has to do with why uh, EGFR inhibitors fail. Um, I remember when I was starting uh, and uh, submitting my, my grants, my NIH grants, you know, back in the 90s, everyone was saying, well, you know, these targeted inhibitors are great, and that's going to be the future of, of uh, glioblastoma treatments. If we get these combinations of targeted inhibitors, why not study that? Um, well, we've done 15 years of trials with, with uh, inhibitors, the most common of which are the EGFR inhibitors, and they've all failed. So, so, uh, but we have tissue samples on all these patients, so we've been able to kind of ask the question, why? And then radiation, you know, radiation's been around since the 1970s, so, so why does radiation not cure glioblastoma? You know, in a, in a petri dish, if you radiate glioblastoma cells, they're actually very radiosensitive, you know, they, they die. So why is it that we can't, you know, cure this disease and that the, the tumors come back? So, uh, so the first project of in our sport is, you know, like I said, why do immunotherapies fail? And you know, one of the reasons is, as I mentioned, you know, when you give, uh, you know, the active vaccination, sometimes these T cells uh, actually uh, have upregulation of PD1, and uh, and that's actually a marker of T cell exhaustion. So, so the, the T cells actually, even though they get in, they're not working, and that's where. Um, that's why we are now designing trials with combinations of these for, for those, um, those patients. Um, the other kind of problem, and, and I kind of view research as, as solving problems. Um, the other problem in this field is um, the, the problem of, as I mentioned, pseudoprogression, and also finding out you know, which tumors um, actually do have immune cells going to them and which don't, because the ones that do have immune cells going into them, maybe those are the ones that do not enroll in the checkpoint inhibitor trials. But if you're not getting the immune cells in there to begin with, you know, giving a checkpoint inhibitor doesn't really work in that context. So another uh, area that, that we, we do a lot of research in at, at UCLA is imaging. So we've actually uh, developed a way to image uh, immune infiltration by using PET scan and MRI, and, and actually a very specific pet tracer called clofarabine. Um, the, the nice thing about our institutions, we have, we have five cyclotrons, so, so a lot of <coughs> different pet tracers that we could test in terms of specific tracers that could detect uh, it, um, immune cells. And then the third thing to consider is the timing. When we kind of design these trials, we really have to be cognizant of, of actually the timing of when we get these treatments, and I don't think People really think about that enough because people kind of, you know, we design trials and they're like, we give this to, to one group and give this, you know, and, and give something else or give placebo to another group. 
but it could just be the, the modification and timing that, that makes a difference. So, so, uh, so three kind of things we, we want to kind of uh, fix in the field is how we detect progression <laughs> or response uh, to treatment, uh, what kind of combinations we should be using, and also the timing of these combinations of trials. So this is our, um, our SPORE-funded uh, clinical trial that we're going to be starting uh, in the summer. And, and really, it kind of takes all of that uh, data from, from our previous trials and tries to combine it. Um, and so it's really it's a randomized trial using neoadjuvant uh, PD-1 inhibitor in one group, placebo in the other group. We're going to do surgery in both groups because we did find that surgery does make a difference if we do surgery on um, these patients potentially could do better. Um, well, you know, a lot of analysis on the tumor tissue uh, when we do that, and then subsequently uh, we'll go on to give uh, the adjuvant, uh, you know, PD-1 inhibitor uh, plus the, uh, or, or, or the uh, dendritic cell vaccine plus or minus the inhibitor. Um, the Getting to the second question, why do EGFR inhibitors fail? One problem is that we don't really actually get into the brain. The, uh, the percent penetration is quite low. Um, so uh, Dave Nathanson, who's actually the PI of, of this project, and Rob Prince was the PI of the, uh, the first project, uh, he actually uh, thought about this a little bit differently. Um, so one, uh, he worked with our medicinal chemist and then uh, is developing a better uh, brain penetrant EGFR, EGFR inhibitor. But it's not just inhibiting EGFR, that, that's uh, really probably not enough. But what they did find is, you know, with all those failed trials of EGFR inhibitors that we've had over the years, what we, do, what we did find is that in those tumor samples, you do get a population of them that actually have this um, change in glucose metabolism, because we have cell cultures on all these cells, so as you say, we'll test this. And, uh, and he recently just published this um, uh, paper and, and the concept is that you, when you give the EGF uh, inhibitor, there's a group of patients that, uh, where the tumors go into this apoptotic state because of decreased metabolism, and then you can treat them with a, uh, a P53 agent to really uh, drive them into apoptosis. Um, and uh, this is kind of the, this, this particular project uh, using Tegriso or this new EGF inhibitor that, that uh, we've developed giving the, the inhibitor, and then the thing is, not everybody has this altered metastat uh, metabolic state, so we don't want to enroll everybody into this trial. So there's a PET scan that, that's involved in this as well, and what we found is that for the patients that do get this altered metabolic state, which we can detect on PET scan, those would then go on to get the uh, uh, apoptotic agent and then really kind of drive that cell to, uh, to cell death. Because the problem with the EGFR inhibitors is that it does kind of keep things at bay, but the durability of these uh, treatments are really low. They actually don't uh, don't have a sustained response because the cells aren't really dead; they're just kind of knocked down. And then finally, uh, why do why does radiation fail? Uh, Fred Pujol, who's in our radiation oncology department, uh, has developed this hypothesis of radiation-induced. Uh, we all want to do some cell phenotypes. So when you radiate cells, what you found was that there's a population of, you know, of cells that actually become radio-resistant. So even though the bulk of the tumor uh, dies with radiation, there's a population that, that doesn't. Uh, and you know, he's shown that this particular population, and, and you know, several other uh, people have kind of looked at this, this kind of glioma stem cell phenotype where these cells continue to grow, and that's uh, why radiation fails, because you do kind of induce this phenotype conversion into the radio-resistant cell. And you know, he had lots of data showing why that is. Uh, but uh, so what he did was take that population of cells and then screen a bunch of agents uh, for what can reverse this phenotypic conversion. And it turns out that the most potent agents are actually dopamine antagonists. Um, the most potent of which is uh, quetiapine. Um, and, and what it does is um, it does basically uh, change this conversion. So when you radiate the cells, the cells don't go into this uh, stem cell-like or glioma-inducing-like state. 
Um, and quetiapine is actually cerebral. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's an FDA-approved drug. It actually makes people very calm. So this is actually the, the, the trial. It's basically radiation plus or minus cerebral. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we have the tumor tissues we put into, we actually have this whole bank of patient avatars that we, we grow the, the tumors in mice now and we can test them, radiate the mice um, and, you know, as much as we want to really kind of test this hypothesis. So uh, in conclusion, you know, in terms of you know, perspectives of the future of glioblastoma treatment, and granted this was just a uh, you know, my 25-year perspective. Hopefully in 25 years, I'll have a 50-year perspective like Dr. Rogen. Um, but um, one perspective, and I think one, one takeaway, is that we really need to learn from our failures. The, uh, we've had a lot of failed trials with glioblastoma, and you know, a lot of people just jump from one to another, and, and it's like, well, that failed, I'm gonna try a different area. Um, you know, deep down, I've always believed that immune therapy works. Uh, it's just kind of figuring out how to make it work. And uh, and so even when things weren't, uh, I guess the field wasn't popular, it always, uh, to me, felt like it made sense because there's no way we could get those cells that we don't see. Um, and uh, I know Mr. Goodkin's a hockey fan. <laughs> um, this is actually one of my favorite co quotes uh, from Wayne Gretzky. As, as many of you have heard, is, is to really kind of skate to where the book is going and not where it's been. And I think in terms of uh, you know younger people going into the field today, um, it's probably good to go to a field that's not popular today. It's something that you have to think about what's going to be kind of the hot new thing 10, 20 years from now, not what everyone's doing now, because um, it's it's competitive. It's a competitive environment, and uh, and I can tell you. I mean, I think the only reason that I you know stayed in this field so long is because it wasn't very competitive in brain to tumor immunotherapy in the nineties. Very few people were doing it, so uh, so it was actually easier to, to get published and to get grants if you could convince people that your your data um, makes sense. Uh, so finally, I think you know. Uh, uh, another you know, quote I want to leave you with is don't follow the crowd, let the crowd follow you. Um, I was a political science major in college and uh, Margaret Thatcher was always you know, one of those people that uh, I read a lot about and, and admired. And talking about let the crowd follow you, uh, you know, when I started uh, you know, in my lab, um, when I got my first key awake, um, I hired a postdoc, one postdoc, and I got draw prints. The gentleman up in the middle there, uh, and now he's a full professor, and he's actually a senior author on a lot of our joint papers now, and he's actually uh, quite an accomplished uh, immunologist in, in the neuro-oncology field. And uh, and we had one neuro-oncologist, and that was Tim Clousey, uh, and I've been with him for 25 years now. And now we have 20 labs at UCLA that study uh, brain tumors, and we have a lot of people on our EAB that, that advise us on, on all these projects. And, and trials, and it's, it's really been a, uh, a very kind of um, fun uh, group of people to work with, but, but uh, you know, rewarding um, uh, endeavor over the years. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for your time, and uh, it is such an honor to be here. Um, I, I really look up to, to, to Rich. I mean, I just, you know, I, He's done such a wonderful job with the department here, and you know all, all the researchers here, you know, are, are just uh, amazing. Um, you know, to get to you know, get to see Jeff at all the 25 meetings. So, so I know you guys do a lot of exciting research here. Thank you so much for having me.